and uh, I pray this often before I preach at, at our church, is that God would raise up a generation as expectant to come to the word as we do to worship. That we could, that we could raise up a generation as passionate about theology as they are revival. And uh, that, that a generation, we talk about the worship night. What about the word night? That, that a generation would, would show up at the word night. Um, that, that, we would, that we'd be as embedded in our story as we are in the songs of our day. And I'm going to pray that right now. I, I, there's a, there's a, a, you know, some, some pictures in Scripture that always move me. One of them is um, Jesus who comes alongside the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And here they are, discouraged, sadness written across their face. Here's a generation walking away from community, walking away from the church, walking away from destiny. We live in that day. And here they are, Jesus, risen from the dead Jesus comes and begins to walk with them. And they, they don't even know it. Um, they think he's dead. When, when, we, when we walk away from community, when we walk away from the story, we write our own story. And in, in a culture of competing narratives, Jesus comes alongside these disciples and begins to um, read and rehearse and reenact the story of God. And when they, when they finally see him and they encounter him, he not only breaks open the story of God, but he breaks open his own life. And when he breaks open his own life, they see him. And they say to themselves, weren't our hearts burning? Our hearts were burning as, as he preached. Could you imagine Jesus preaching his word to you? You know what I mean? Like, hey, we've got a guest speaker today. Yeah, it's Jesus. Come on out, you know. And it's going to be lit. You know, that's... You're, listen, listen, you're so, Lyle's so cool, he can get away with the word lit. Whenever I use that word, my daughter's like, hey, Dad, please never use that word again. You know what I mean? Like, so Jesus, he, he preaches to them, and their hearts are burning, and it's just this picture that we, that God's raising up, he's raising up storytellers. Because the future belongs to the storytellers. He's raising up He's raising up uh, those who will sing it, who will tweet it, who will write it, who will preach it. He's raising up prophets and storytellers and voices um, in our day that are going to take this story. They're, they're the theologians filled with the Spirit of God, right? We need, we need theology back, back in the revivalists. And we need revival back in the theologians. And, and, and there's a marriage that God wants to do in this generation that... That, that we come we come to the song of the Lord like we come to the, 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 the story of the Lord. And so I'm going to pray that right now. I'm going to pray in Acts chapter 16. Um, there's a woman named Lydia. And uh, the Bible says this, that Paul preached the word. It's beautiful. He preached the word. And it said God opened her heart and she received the word. Because you can actually hear the word and not receive it. So there's, there's a miracle that, that must happen in preaching. There's a miracle. And we ask God, every time we come to the word, we ask God for the miracle. God, I want the miracle. What you did, what you did in Lydia's heart, do in my heart, God. Open my heart so I can actually receive what you're doing. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls this the incarnation of the word. So this is what he says. This is encouraging for any preacher. Um, I'm not even preaching yet. But, but Dietrich says this. He says that, that during the preaching of the word, Jesus himself comes and walks among his church, putting his hand on each person. So I picture this sometimes when I'm, when I'm preaching, whether, whether, whether the word's great or not. I picture Jesus showing up, and he doesn't care because he's, he's about to do something. That as I preach, I, I picture Jesus walking among the church, and he's taking his word, and he's putting it into people. He, he's embedding them in his narrative and his story. There, there's something, listen, this is what I'm saying. If you're here and you're like, what's he talking about? There is something that happens when we submit ourselves to the word that doesn't happen when we submit ourselves to Netflix. Do you know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. There's something that happens when I'm, I'm submitted to the story of God.
There's a miracle in it. There's, there's an incarnation of Jesus when I come and go, hey, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a student of his word. So God, I pray right now that as I preach, God, we thank you for the pads. God, I just pray that, that as I preach, God, that you would open hearts, that we could receive something. That Jesus himself, God, regardless of, of this word and how it lands, and if, if it lands, God, that Jesus himself would walk among this church, he would put his hands on us, and that he would release his word, God. We pray for the miracle God of the word to happen in this place. God, I, I pray that e even, in the, God, that you would, that the spirit of God would come upon um, future preachers. God, theologians, revivalists, storytellers, songwriters. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, if you guys would turn to 1 Samuel Chapter 16, this is one of my, my favorite stories in the Bible. I called Lyle last week and I said, hey man, I need some help. I've got four stories, four Old Testament stories burning in me right now and I don't know which one to bring. And he's all laid on me. And so I shared, I said, I got this story, I've got this, this thing's on my heart, I could come preach this. And, and the first thing he said is this, he's like, hey man, listen, bring whatever's on your heart. We're going to love it. We're going to love it, whatever you bring. But then as I started to share about like these different, the Elijah word and, and the, the Naaman word, and I got to this, the Samuel word, he's all, that's the one. That's the one. And so if this message, listen, if this message really moves you, if, if this message really lands on your heart, we can thank Lyle for it. Because Lyle picked it. Lyle picked it. I could say, like, we sought the Lord for an hour. Like, we went into a, a virtual prayer room together and we sought the Lord, but we didn't. I was like, hey, pick one. He's like, yeah, that's the one. So Lyle picked it. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If this message doesn't land, if this message just, if you leave and you're like, what was that? Lyle picked it. Your pastor picked this message. I wanted to preach Elijah. I wanted to preach my name and word. 1 Samuel 16, 1. Now the Lord spoke to Samuel and said this, You've mourned long enough for Saul. I've rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there. For I've chosen one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, How can I do that if Saul, the king, hears about it, he will kill me? The Lord replied, Take a heifer with you. So here's the thing, has God ever asked you to do something that made you afraid? The Bible says if you're ever afraid to do what God's asked you to do, take a heifer with you. That's what the Lord says, take a heifer. So he takes a heifer to make this, this sacrifice in Bethlehem. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel the prophet shows up in this little town of Bethlehem and everyone in Bethlehem thinks they're in trouble. Because when the prophet shows up, obviously like, you've done something wrong. So he shows up and they're, they're afraid. So uh, Samuel's afraid, uh, the village is afraid, everyone's afraid. But Samuel has a, a heifer. <laughs> Samuel says, I, I've, come, I've come in peace. I, don't be afraid. He said, I've come to choose the next king. Verse 6, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God says to Samuel, Samuel, you're doing what, what man does. You're not seeing what heaven sees. Samuel sees the, the tallest. He sees the most spiritual. He sees the most handsome. He, he sees the one that looks like a king on the outward. And he says, no, 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 
Samuel, you're, you're, you're choosing. In other words, you're about to choose another Saul. But I've rejected Saul. Saul was the man's king. The people of God wanted to be like the other nations. And because they wanted to be like the other nations, whenever we are more infatuated with the image of culture than the image of God, we begin to see the things that, that men see and not the, the things that God sees. And God confronts Samuel and says, you're not seeing through the eyes of God, you're, you're seeing the outward appearance. So then Jesse told his second son, Abinadab, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. And God said, this isn't the one. And all seven of Jesse's sons walk in front of Samuel. They stand in the, the presence of God and the presence of the prophet. And not one of them God chooses. And then there's this, this unlikely moment where Samuel... At this point, he's thinking, uh, did I get the right Jesse? Am I in the right Bethlehem, right? Like, hey, hey so uh, do you have another son? And Jesse says, oh, oh yeah, there's, there's David. But he's the youngest, and he's in the field. These are two of the most derogatory things you could say about a young man. To say that he's the youngest wasn't just the youngest of age, but it, it was to say that he was the least and to be a shepherd in the field was the least desired job. So really what Jesse says is, yeah, but, yeah, but he's the least of the least. Unnoticed, uninvited to the party, unseen by his dad. The, the prophet comes to town and, and David does, doesn't even get invited. Have you ever felt like David? Have you ever been sitting in the 12th row? You're in a crowd of people, but you're wondering, does God even see me? Do my leaders see me? Do my friends see me? Samuel says this, then send for him at once. David gets sent for. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. They're at this table. The prophetic imagery here is stunning. They're at a table. And Samuel says, we will not sit down and eat until David comes home. Send for him at once. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. When David came to the table, the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because isn't this every father, every mother's dream? Like isn't this heaven's dream that the Spirit of God would come upon our sons and daughters from that day on? Samuel pours oil over David. But heaven pours the Spirit out over David. When Samuel puts his hands on a young man, heaven puts its spirit on a young man. See, God can find you anywhere. We, we talk about finding God, like we're on this journey to find God, as if we find God. Like, we don't find God, God finds us. Like, God finds us. Like, God, the same God that found Jonah, that found Daniel, that found Esther, that found Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the same God that found Peter, that found... Paul on that road, like, that God can find you. God finds us. We don't find him. God found David in the field, but there's something profound that happens when God finds a David. God is calling home sons and daughters. And when God locks his eyes on a young man, on a daughter, when God finds David, he sends Samuel. When God finds sons and daughters, he sends fathers and mothers. The Bible says that God was looking for a man after his own heart. 
when God finds a son after his own heart, God looks for a father after his own heart. Uh, the God that could have talked to David doesn't talk to David, but talks to Samuel. God sees David in the room and could go to David and go, hey, David, I choose you. But, but God, instead of going to David, God finds Samuel and sends Samuel to David. Because God is building family. And God doesn't move around fathers and mothers. He moves through fathers and mothers. The God that could do it without family, the God that could do it without Samuel, chooses to do it through Samuel. Which to me is pretty cool. God sends Samuel. Uh, before God awakens David's heart, God awakens Samuel's heart. I, I'm convinced, and I'll, I'll do my best to preach it this morning, but I'm convinced that God's raising up fathers and mothers in the church. Uh, Legacy is a young church. This is not an age thing. This is an identity thing. Uh, becoming Samuel so that David can become David. And, and the tragic thing is this, when... When Samuel gets stuck in his failure, David gets stuck in his field. There's a generation of Davids longing and waiting for Samuel to become who he is. For mothers and fathers to step into their anointing so that David can step into his anointing. Because it wasn't until Samuel put his hands on David that heaven put its hands on David. But here's the first thing that, that God says to Samuel, because there's a journey to become Samuel. The Lord spoke to Samuel and said this, you've mourned long enough. The first word to Samuel is, you've mourned long enough. So apparently, Samuel's been mourning. So a lot has happened in Samuel's life, but one of the things that's happened is, Samuel has anointed Saul to be the king. The people want a king. And God says, hey, hey, listen, you don't want a man king. You want a God king. I'm supposed to be your king. And they said, no, we want to be like the other nations. We want a man king. And, and God pleads with them and says, this is what you get with a man king. This is what you get, this is what you get with a God king. And they said, no, we want a man king. And so they choose Saul. So Samuel reluctantly partners with God to give the people what they want. It's profound that God will actually give you what you want. Too often we blame God for decisions we've made in our lives. Well, God let this happen. There, there are moments where God actually gives you what you want. So they get Saul is their king. Samuel anoints his spiritual son to be the king. And, and Saul, because he feared man rather than fearing God, Saul fails Israel and God rejects him. So here's, here's Samuel, his own sons that he raised to be men of God, the Bible says were corrupt and greedy. So he's grieving the fact that his sons don't look like him and they don't look like God. And then he anoints a spiritual son. He's on a journey to raise up the next generation, and it is not working. So Samuel's living in a chapter called failure. God meets Samuel in his failure and says to Samuel, you've mourned long enough. God doesn't say, don't mourn. God says, you've mourned long enough. Because God leads us into pain. Your future is in and through your pain. God leads us. We, we don't numb pain. We don't avoid pain. When we resist pain, we never quite live into the fullness of our life. Like you can only walk in fullness when you learn to walk into your pain and through your pain. 
So anyone that says yes to Jesus is saying yes to a journey through their pain. Embracing your pain doesn't make you weak. It makes you like Jesus. So we're a people learning to embrace pain. Because pain happens. Pain is normal. The church doesn't avoid pain. We walk right into pain. Because here's the reality. Jesus doesn't heal you around pain. He heals you through pain. Jesus doesn't heal you around depression. He heals you through depression. Jesus doesn't heal you around. He doesn't take you around your anxiety. He heals you through your anxiety. Because if you can allow God to lead you through your pain, you can overcome anything. We've been there. We've done that. God doesn't rescue us from pain. He meets us in our pain. We need a much deeper, and much richer theology of pain in the church because we are a pain people. We, we, we worship the one who bled to death on a cross. And if Jesus went to the cross, why wouldn't he lead us there? So, so pain doesn't mean that God's abandoned you. Oftentimes it means he's, he, he's actually called you. And God begins to heal us through our pain. But, but here's the reality, as we begin to face our pain, as we, because here's the thing, uh, even, though, even though God leads us into pain, he also leads us from our pain. Because pain is meant not to define you, but transform you. And, and the choice is yours. Like your pain either defines you or it transforms you. And, and if we live in pain too long, it begins to define us, and it becomes our name. And the same, the same God that meets us in pain knows exactly how to lead us through our pain. And this is why we need community, and we need to know the voice of God, because we need to know when God's leading us into pain and when he's calling us out of pain. And so God meets Samuel and says, hey, hey, Samuel, I know you're in pain. I, I know you feel like you've failed Israel. I want to encounter you in that, but you've mourned long enough. I'm calling you out of mourning now. I think sometimes we just, we mourn too long. We live in pain too long. Sometimes I, I just think that it, when you live in it long enough, it's hard to leave it. And we need encounters with the Lord, and we need people in our life that see us to go, hey, hey listen, that doesn't define you any longer. Like, you got to come out of that cave. David went into a cave because Saul was chasing him. There's a time to go into a cave. He went into a cave for his life. Five verses later, God sends David, the prophet Gad, to call him out of the cave. And the prophet says, hey, hey, listen, I know you came into this cave for your life, but if you stay in this cave any longer, you're going to lose your life. So he needed, listen, the, the place that was safe for four verses was no longer safe for David. So God knew how to lead him into the cave. And there are seasons where God leads us into caves. But God knew how to call him out of it. God's calling Samuel out of a cave called failure here. You've mourned long enough for Saul. I'm calling you out. For I've rejected him as king. So fill your flask. So here's the thing. E even though God will meet us in, in, in our pain and he'll lead us through our pain, here's the reality. We cannot allow one chapter of our life to define our whole story. Like God's writing a stunning story. I, I heard someone say, a few years back, they said the Bible's holy because it tells the whole story. It's like your life's holy because God tells your whole story. And if we, if we come and we bring only like our sexy scenes, you know what I mean, or, or, or the parts of our story we're, we're not ashamed of, if we come, we come with our, our, our pretty and our best days or our Instagram moments. Like here's the reality. When you, when you hide parts of your story, because God doesn't edit your story. God wants all of it. And your whole story reveals his whole grace. And some of us, we haven't brought our whole story. The, the journey into sonship 
the journey into daughterhood. And you don't become a father without first being a son. So the journey to become Samuel begins with bringing every part of your story to God and say, would you redeem every single chapter? But when we hide parts of our story, we hide parts of God. When we live in shame, we don't actually reveal Jesus to the world. Because God wants to show up, and I'm telling you, some of the, the chapters we are most uh, ashamed of actually carry the most transformation. God says to Samuel, you've mourned long enough. So fill your flask with oil. I just love that. Fill your flask. Because apparently his flask has gone empty. God's saying to Samuel, there's another king on the other side of your failure. And just because you failed once doesn't mean God won't ask you to do it again. In fact, most often when you failed, God will ask you to do it again. So God asks Samuel to take the same flask and get filled again. Makes me think of the disciples. Throw in the same nets. Or Elijah, I'm sending you back the same way. Or Moses, throw down that same staff. But Moses, he throws down the staff, and when he picks it up, it becomes God's staff. Fill your flask again. Because when I'm full, I can see the Davids. Listen, when I'm full, I can see what God's doing in front of me. When I'm empty, it's hard to see what God's doing. I start writing my own narrative. I start believing my own story. Uh, I start redefining who God is. I start redefining his story. When I'm empty, I get desperate. But when I'm full, I can see what God's doing in front of me. Can you imagine being Samuel standing in front of David? Now, we, we, get to, we know David from the rearview mirror. Right, we, we realize who David becomes in the story, but Samuel doesn't know who David is. Can you imagine standing in front of the next David, but your flask is empty? Everything in you wants to pour something over him, but you have nothing to give. Nothing. God is looking for fathers and mothers that are full and dripping with his spirit. So when they begin to see and put their hands on sons and daughters, heaven can pour out over them. You've mourned long enough. Now fill your flask. Get full. Uh, the older I get, hmm, the whiter my beard gets. There's something that I'm learning. Early on, I just wanted to be passionate. Early on, God, keep me passionate. I want to be on fire. And that was my prayer in my 20s. Now as I begin my 40s, I'm not asking for passion anymore. I just want to be full. I just want to be full. God, keep me full. I want to stay full so I can see the David, so I can see the daughters in front of me. God, I just, I just want, to, I want to have something to offer the next generation. I just want to put my hands on them, and, and God, I want to see you put your hands on them. I don't need to be the most passionate. I don't need to be a great preacher. I don't need to be on stage. God, I don't need a greater stage, but I need a greater flask. I want to be full, God. It's been one of my prayers. I'm more convinced. Early on, I was so convinced God wanted to get me somewhere. I didn't want to miss the doors. I, I wanted to get where God was going. I didn't want to miss God. My prayers, I want to see you. I don't want to miss the stage you want me on. I don't want to say yes or no to the wrong things. And the older I get, I don't care about that stuff anymore. My prayers are, I, I'm convinced. This is maybe the greatest revelation that, that, that I'm believing in, in these past years. That God's not trying to get me somewhere. He's trying to get me open. 
God's not looking for spiritual people. He's not even looking for fiery people. He's not looking for passion. He's looking for people who are open. God, I want to be open. I want my flask to be full in the moment, God. Fill your flask again. And then God says to, to Samuel, go find a man named Jesse. Now this part of the story, if you're, if you're a preacher, have you ever found those verses, those parts of the story where you're, where, where you're like, man, what's that mean? What's that mean? God says to Samuel, there's a man named Jesse. I've chosen one of his sons. Now I'm thinking, if God knows Jesse's name, he's got to know David's name. Yeah. Yeah, why not like, hey, there's a boy named David. Go find him. Come on, make this story a lot easier. Then you don't have a bunch of angry brothers. You're making this hard for David, God. Because Eliab's mad now. The whole family's upset. Like, come on. Why don't you just leave the family out of it? But I asked the Lord, I said, why Jesse? And God's like, because listen, I don't. When I pursue sons, I do it through fathers. And I heard the Lord say, I want Jesse in this story. I refuse to engage his son without him. Go find a father named Jesse, because I'm a God of generations. And I'm going to stir the heart of Jesse for this boy, David. I'm going to stir a father's heart for a son he can't even see. I'm going to help Jesse see the son he doesn't even invite. Go find a man named Jesse. You got, guys, I'm convinced the future of the church is not around stages, it's around tables. And the future church, listen, the future church will only be as strong as its fathers and mothers. God's raising up a generation that, that learn how to do life on life around tables. They learn how to put their hands on sons and daughters. Your, your greatest legacy, listen, your greatest legacy is not going to happen when the Spirit of God comes upon altars, but when the Spirit of God comes upon sons and daughters. A few years back, there was a, a gathering in our part of the woods called L.A., called Azusa Now, where, where thousands, how many of you were, flew out to Azusa Now? Thousands of worshipers, like 80,000 gathered in a stadium, and th this is, you know, a few hours from where we live, and I, I wanted to be there, but that particular weekend, my daughter, Adia, had a soccer tournament. So I talked with my wife, I was torn, I said, hey, I really want to go to this stadium, and she's like, nope. You know, sometimes God speaks to you, sometimes your wife speaks to you. And when your wife speaks to you, you know God's speaking to you, yeah. right? So she's like, hey, we're, we're going to the tournament. And, and, and as much as I was, uh, I was torn, it was an easy decision. We're going to go watch AD play. Um, so we woke up that morning, and, I'm, you know, the whole thing was live streamed. So I'm watching as Zuzan now go down, and people are gathering. It's like the pre-prayer. It's the pre-worship, and I'm already stirred for this thing. And, and here I am at the soccer field, and AD is playing, and, and, uh, and people are worshiping, so I'm kind of living kind of in these two worlds. I'm, I'm kind of living in two fields. And there was this moment as Adia began playing that I had this thought as, you know, as we had chosen a different field that day. I, I remember having this moment where there's no place I would rather be than watching her play right now. And I heard the Lord say, I feel the same way. And I felt the presence of God in that field, and I'm like, what you got, Azusa, now? Like, I know where the Lord's at, but I, I literally, I felt the presence of God as AD was playing soccer. And, and then we came home, and, and uh, in our house, we've got this square table in the middle of our, our kitchen. And, and I opened the laptop, and all day we were listening to worship and, and the word. And, and there were moments, as my kids were younger there, there were moments where my, my daughters would come, and they would gather around the table. And as the worship would go, I, I could hear them singing along with these worshipers in the stadium. And I had another thought. The thought was this. As much as I long to hear 80,000 singing in a stadium, there is no greater joy than hearing my daughters sing. Yeah. 
And then my son was there, and he wasn't singing. He was playing video games or something. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I had this other thought that as much as I long to see stadiums filled, my prayer is to see my son filled. There, there's something about these moments where God truly defines what's on your life. You must pay attention to these moments. Um, God spoke to me months later. He said, uh, this is not the word you want to hear from the Lord, but he said, he, he said you're not going to have a big church. And I'm like, okay. But he said, you're going to have big sons and daughters. And I heard the Lord say, never, do not measure your success by the size of your ministry, but measure success by the size of your legacy. And, and listen, th this moment marked me because we, we can actually look to the wrong things. We can look to the wrong altars. You will get discouraged when you're looking for God to do in your life what's not on your life. And this is why we cannot compare ourselves to others. You, you have to know what's on your life, and you need identity encounters with the Lord to go, hey, I know what's on my life. And we don't have a big church, but we are raising up some big sons and daughters. And, and, and honestly, like the stirring, when I look at other ministries, we don't have a great ministry, but we have a stunning legacy that we are building. Listen, ministry is what you build with your own hands. Your legacy is what you build through the hands of your sons and your daughters. And as we worshiped around the table that day, I heard the Lord say, revival looks like family. Revival looks like family. I mean, years ago, when we first planted our church, two years in, this is 12 years ago, two years in, uh, you know, our heart was to see young adults come to Jesus, to see a generation of sons and daughters come into the fullness of who they are. And uh, I was in New York at a conference, and, and this black girl walked right up to me. She was shaking. She said, I have a word for you. She said, I never do this, but I have a word for you. Uh, when someone says, I never do this, you know it's going to be good, you know. You know it's going to be God. She's like, I never do this. She said, God's flipping the script on you. She said, God's called you to young adults and to raise up sons and daughters, but he's flipping the script. God's actually asking you to raise up fathers and mothers. To prepare fathers and mothers for the young adults that are coming. She said this, she says, because it is, listen, it's irresponsible. It, 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 it's insane to call home sons and daughters without calling out fathers and mothers. And that moment marked me, and I thought, wow, I thought we were after young people. But it sounds like we're after family. So I, I, was, pre I was preaching a message like this in San Jose a couple years ago. And I woke up and I heard the Lord say, David's here. And one of the things I do is I, I pray before I message because I, I like, is, does God want to say something? Is there something unique he wants to say? Something he wants to breathe on? The Lord said, David's here. So I showed up and I'm kind of like, all right, you know, and I was preaching a, a David message. So I just assumed like the David generation's here. You know what I mean? Like, like David's here. Of course, like Elijah's here. Every man in here with a beard, like Elijah, you know. <laughs> and so, so I preached this message and at the end, I, I felt like I was supposed to call young people forward. There was a moment to call young people that just were hungry for God, were hungry to come into sonship and daughterhood. And, and, uh, and so I did this call, um, and nobody stood. And then, I, and then it's that moment. It's that moment where, uh, as a preacher, you're not sure what to do because you, you feel the Lord on it but not on you. That's that moment. And so what we do, we just kind of stand there, and we, we kind of nod, and we pretend that we're in a conversation with God. We pretend it's like a holy conversation, like, like, uh, like yeah, I know you love me, but really it's like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, like God, what? And so I just, I just hey, we're going to wait for a minute. And that's the spiritual way. Um, could the pads come in right now? Like, it's all these... It's all these ways that we kind of like make it more comfortable for us because, because we took the risk. But it's like, man, if there were some pads right now, like this would, this would, somebody would stand. You know, it would, it would feel more holy. And so we waited a second. This kid in the back of the room stands up. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, thank you. The moment he stood up, 15 young men stood up across the room because it only takes one. So I, I called him out. I'm like, hey, what's your name? And he's like, David. And the Lord's like, David's here. I wish I would have called him out. I wish I would have, David's here. Where are you at, David? But I didn't. I didn't have the courage. 
So he stood up and I said, hey, hey, would you come down here? Because I saw his shirt said, I must go. His shirt. And I thought it was prophetic. And he runs forward and he stands up there. And then I see the whole shirt. It says, I must go. Video games are calling. So in this moment, I'm like, oh, man. Like, I thought it was prophetic and it's not. But I'm like, hey, man. Like, video games have been calling you, but now Jesus is calling you. So I, I, I redeemed the moment. And, and we, called these, we called these sons forward, and we called these daughters forward, and they, uh, oh, don't you love the pads? Oh, man. You feel that? I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to preach into the 11 o'clock. Can I do that? I'm just getting started right now. Those pads. Oh, man. And that beard. Hey, you know you've got a good church when people, when people cheer for the beard more than Jesus. You know, you know something's, something's on, off, kind of. This, this, boy, this boy comes forward. He's standing in the front. And we begin to pray. And I, and, and I give this call. I said, are there, are there fathers and mothers here that it's time to put your hands on sons and daughters? This was a culture where... where uh, where, where ministry time was rare. I was told afterwards that was the first time they had ever called people to the front of the church. I didn't know that. You can break the rules when you don't know the rules. I, I called fathers and mothers out, and this man from the back of the room starts wailing. He runs as fast as he could. It was David's dad. And he puts his hand on his son, not just his hands. I mean, he wrapped his body around his son. And he wailed over his son, and something broke in the room. And God began to release something on fathers and mothers. I remember that moment. It's the moment where you realize the thing that happened was more anointed than your message. I just kind of stood back, and we just let it happen. And afterwards, I was, I was told that, that in this culture, for a, for a dad to run and for a dad to weep, for a dad to show emotion, for a dad to wrap himself around his son, he said, we've never seen that before. I think sometimes you have to see something before you can actually become it. Let's just invite his presence right now. Would you come, Holy Spirit? Would you come? God, I, there's, there's so much more I could say, but God, what, what are you saying? The revival many of us are longing for will not come through better gatherings, but through better fatherings and motherings. Fathering and mothering is not an age thing. It's an identity thing. It will not come through better sermons and strategies but through bigger sons and daughters. The revival you long for will not come through more power, but through more empowerment. But you can't offer your story to a generation if you haven't fully offered it to God. I want to pray for a couple things right now. I, I feel like we could pray for all kinds of things, but I want to pray for those that, that uh, it, it's time. It's time to offer your whole story to God. It's, it's time God's calling you into your pain. He's calling you into your shame. He's calling you into your depression. He, he's not here to rescue you from it. He's, he's here to meet you. And if that's you, just stand where you're at. The, the chapter of your life that you haven't fully given to him, the, the, the disappointment, the disillusionment, the disconnectedness, and you're saying, God, meet me in that. I, God, would you write into that story? If that's you, if, if he's calling you into that place, would you just stand wherever you're at? Holy Spirit, come. God, a generation who will stay in their pain long enough to have something to offer the next generation. God, God a Samuel generation willing to mourn long enough to not leave David bored without giants. Uh, I want to pray for those right now that are here that, that there's a sense of God saying you've mourned long enough. You've actually lived in it long enough. I know there are some of you here. When I woke up this morning, I felt like the Lord said, there's some of you that he's about to say, enough. 
enough. You, you've, you've let that define you. If that's you, stand where you're at. You've mourned long enough. You've, it's defined you long enough. It's been your name long enough. And God's saying, I'm calling you out of it. It's not who you are. And if you're here and it's just time to get filled again, you feel empty, you feel disconnected. Maybe you, you filled up with the wrong flask. Maybe you're, you're building the kingdom of this world. Maybe, maybe you're here and, and you're putting your hands to your job, but you have no idea how to put your hands to sons and daughters. You've never experienced the supernatural that happens when you pour your life over someone. If that's you, just stand. I feel like the, the Lord wants to commission you into that. He wants to fill you. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come, God? God, would you put on us an anointing, God, for a generation? God, raise up fathers and mothers in this place. Jesus, that legacy could actually walk into the fullness of their name. God, a people excited, God, to come to church, not because of the gathering, but who can I throw my arms around? Who can I walk with? Who can I pour my life over? God, the future of the church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, we love you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. All God's people said, amen, amen. Come on. Come on, let's bless Pastor Nate. I whispered in his ear, I told you I picked the right one. <laughs> I, did, I, didn't, I, did, I didn't say that to him. I said, bro, that message is deeper than you know. Um, for anybody who's been a part of this church for any length of time whatsoever, you know the accuracy of God's word for this house and the deposit that was just made for this culture and for our future and for where God is leading us to go. And so I just want to stand and say, uh, Pastor Nate, we receive it in its fullness and we bless the seed that was sown today and we declare 100 fold fruitfulness church will you join me in that Woo. we receive that we receive that oh my goodness it, it almost makes you want to double dip doesn't it if you'd like to join me i'm about to double dip into second service uh, myself so if you want to hang tight you can uh, but we are so happy that you are here today we love you guys so much this has been such a full and crazy week it really has. I don't know if you guys have been a part of what God has been doing throughout the entirety of this week, but with circuit riders here and prayer room, we did global prayer room Wednesday, local prayer room Thursday, uh, circuit riders thing Friday, Saturday. Like God has just been on the move all week long. And I got to say, I am so grateful to be doing this with you guys. Oh, it's so good. Why don't you find about, I don't know, maybe 55 people and give them a hug or a handshake or something and tell them you love them. We are so happy you're in church today. Uh, hit the connect bar on your way out. We love you so much, Legacy. Blessings.